Now I'll introduce the next speaker. It's uh, Don Raphael Wynn. Uh, he is currently rotating through the neuro-ophthalmology uh, department right now. He went to medical school at the University of Iowa. He's currently a third year neurology resident and he aspires to be a neuro-ophthalmologist. So without further ado. hear me okay? okay. Great. So I wanted to present uh, a really interesting case that I was able to see both on the neurology service, on the inpatient neurology service, as well as the neuro-ophthalmology uh, clinic. Uh, while I was doing my neuro-ophthalmology clinic rotation, um, I was often pulled out uh, around 4 p.m. to go and be backup for the new junior residents and see patients in the emergency department with them and kind of um, guide and direct them. So this is a patient I got to see Okay, so our patient is a Mr. S. He's 74 years old, and he uh, has a sudden onset of double vision and also a dizziness. The timeline for this is that at 6 a.m., he wakes up, he's doing fine, no problems, goes to the bathroom, goes back to bed, lays down, and he gets up at 7, and now the room is spinning around him. He feels nauseous, and then he states that everything looks like a Picasso painting. So... What do you mean it looks like a Picasso painting? And he says, well, there's seven, I think we had seven people in the room with uh, several residents and medical students in the, it was a small emergency department room. And it just irritated him to have so many people in there. He, he saw, you know, um, 14 people. And uh, the, the double image of some of the people was, uh, was kind of working its way up here while the, the other image was working its way down here. And just everything was kind of a jumble. So he just wanted to keep his eyes closed. So more specifically regarding his diplopia, it's, it's there all the time since it started uh, when he woke up at 7. And the images were separated horizontally initially, but later they were separated uh, more obliquely. And it was worse whenever he tried to look to the right. And, uh, but he wasn't certain if it was worse looking at things in a distance or things up close. And then it was binocular. It resolved when he covered one eye. He preferred to cover his left eye. And there was no pain with eye movement, although when we were examining him, he started, to, uh, uh, he started to get a headache at that time, and so there was some confusion as to whether or not he did have some eye pain. But we uh, just more careful questioning resolved that there was no actual eye pain. It was just a mild headache he was getting. So really briefly with his past medical history, um, he has a history of hypothyroidism. Uh, he's had some migraines in his 20s and 30s, but hasn't really experienced anything since. And uh, he doesn't really have any neurologic history or any really profound medical history that we know of. He's still kind of fresh in that area. He, um, he actually hasn't been to the doctor in a long time. The last physician he saw was, I think, a week or two before this. He saw Dr. Katz for a subclinical rival uh, hemorrhage. But besides that, he hasn't been to see anyone. Um, we get a little bit more into his history, and of note, uh, in his late teens, he says he was a troubled child. Uh, he was in a gang in L.A., and, um, and his parents were really worried about him, thought that he might ha uh, have these behavioral problems because of an uh, underlying endocrine disorder. A doctor decided he had hyperthyroidism, and they did a thyroidectomy. In his mind, this was an unnecessary procedure, kind of like people in the 60s lobotomizing their kids was what he preferred to do, and he didn't think it was necessary. And he didn't really think he had a problem with that. And then a year ago, a year before he presented to us, he started taking uh, Synthroid when he found that he, was, uh, uh, he had hypothyroidism. And then, interesting, he, uh, he was in gangs in, uh, in L.A., and then he made his way to become a professor of art history and architecture, hence the Picasso comparison and a lot of other comparisons. And just kind of a side note, he loved the neuro-ophthalmology clinic and kept commenting on Leonardo da Vinci when he saw all these visions and portraits and, and lenses. He just thought it was the most amazing clinic. He loved it. Um, <laughs> and then he didn't really have uh, much more of note with, with his family history and social history. So um, neurology is consulted. We go down, we see him, and the main thing on, on physical exam is he looks like he has this left-sided apoptosis. On his neuro exam, we notice that he has some left eye closure weakness compared to the right side. It's kind of subtle, um, but it's there. 
And other than the cranial nerve exam, which I'll get to, the rest of his neurologic exam was, was unremarkable. So as I mentioned, he has that top caudal tie and it's injected and he has a uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage in that eye as well, which this can come on very quickly. Um, and then uh, his acuity, um, better on that left side, um, but it's, it's otherwise not too bad. His visual field is okay. The main thing is with his eye movement. So he has this decreased adduction on the left eye, and he has this rotary nystagmus in both eyes in all directions. So it's worse when he tries to look to the right. And it appeared to us that we, we, he could not overcome the adduction problem with convergence. And so um, I'll come back to this later. This is really important. We tried one time. Um, I said, look at my finger, okay, follow it with your eye, okay, no, he's not converging, and we were done, and we didn't, we didn't test it more thoroughly than that. Uh, this in a person who had um, some left hypertrophy and exotrophy, and I don't know if he saw where the finger was when we tried to test it, so. This, uh, I got this off of um, Will's Eye Resident Case Series online, and uh, this case um, was, was really neat to me because it was very similar to our patient in his appearance and also in his MRI findings. And uh, you can see with, um, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, you can see with this gentleman right here, he has this on this left eye. Uh, it, he has some hypertrophia, exotrophia. It's kind of going up in this direction right here. And, uh, and then you can also see over here that he doesn't have any adduction when he's looking over to the right. So this is almost exactly how our patient presented to us, which was a very bizarre presentation to us. And, um, and then in addition to that, just kind of imagine right here that he has a little bit of a proptosis. So we recommend getting an MRI brain. And his brain stem looks clean. Uh, I don't have that image here, but, um, but he, we do find these little punctate foci of diffusion restriction. And uh, I don't have that image here either, but it, we did find it in kind of the end of the cortex, kind of pointing to maybe some kind of embolic shower and, um, and on both sides, so in multiple vascular territories. So then uh, with eyes that strange, we're gonna send them to neuro-ophthalmology clinic next day for sure. And um, if we're going to send them to neuro-ophthalmology clinic, we better give them some imaging that they'd like to work with. So we order an MR of the orbits, and we get, let's see if I can get this to work. It's read as a normal MRI of the orbits. And so we think, okay, doesn't look normal. Um, so we go down and talk to him in more detail, and we get one of the neuro uh, radiology uh, attendings to look at it with us, and we get ourselves an addendum. And so he has some, um, he has that proptosis on the left. It's, it's, uh, it's a little mild, though. And then he has this, um, and I don't know if this is going to come out too well on this, but he has this diffuse um, fatty infiltration of his extraocular muscles here. It's in every extraocular muscle that we image as we kind of scroll up and down. And their overall impression is this could be maybe from a, like a chronic thyroid issue. So we admit him to our service on the inpatient side and we start doing our work up here. So we do la some labs here and really the only things that come up, he's positive for cannabinoids and his thyroid peroxidase antibodies are elevated. But everything else, in inflammatory markers, infectious markers, et cetera, are kind of coming up negative. <coughs> uh, we do a lumbar puncture, um, and his cell count is unremarkable. And I'd just like to point out that I did this lumbar puncture. Um, <laughs> and then um, his protein is unremarkable, infectious workup, opening pressure, really nothing to write home about. So then we come to this question, um, and, and we're really perplexed about this. And so, is this a central process? Is this a peripheral process? Are both co-occurring? That seems highly unlikely. But um, he has the rotary nystagmus. That's got to be central. Um, he has all these recent embolic-like strokes. So maybe this is a stroke that we're just not seeing. Why didn't it show up, show up on MRI? Um, and then peripheral, so he can't overcome the adduction on our exam. And so, okay, it's, it's probably not an INO. It's something else. 
and he has that proptosis, and he appears to have this uh, multiple cranial nerve involvement with the eye closure weakness, uh, with the eye um, being exotrophic and hypertrophic. Um, and so we're not really sure what's going on there. It doesn't appear to be any obvious mass on the MR orbits, but is there some autoimmune issue going on? Do we need to start steroids on this guy ASAP? Just because in the time he's been in the emergency department, it seems like he's gone from this horizontal diplopia to oblique. And um, from the initial ED resident who saw him to us, it seems like his eyes um, have gotten a little worse. So we sent him to our uh, neuro-ophthalmology clinic next day, and uh, he's surprised to see me there. Um, but I didn't examine him alone. Um, so we saw him, and uh, his visual fields are normal. The slit lamp exam is, is within normal range. You know, he has, uh, he has a few findings there with the injection in that left eye. His optic nerves look completely normal. Uh, he has a very slight exophthalmos. Uh, just 19 to 17. Um, and then he has his conjugate rotary and upbeat nystagmus. And he has the hypertrophia, the exotrophia, as we noted, and he has an INO. And so um, he was able to abduct with convergence. We just had to coach him, and we had to really get him to kind of focus on the finger so he knew what he was supposed to do. And so once we got that, things kind of fell a little bit more into place. So our impression that we write up and give back to the neurology team is there's a left INO with a skew deviation, and it's probably because of something in the pontomedullary junction like the MLF. And the thyroid disease is kind of a red herring. There is no uh, acute peripheral issue causing proptosis and uh, the findings on the extraocular muscles in the MRI of the orbits. That's simply his old thyroid disease. He really did have some severe thyroid disease that he got his thyroidectomy for. And a recommendation, get another MRI. <laughs> um, so we get some repeat. You know what you're looking for. You often can get an X-ray. <laughs> <laughs> and so we get a repeat MRI, and there it is. And it's exactly um, where it was predicted by the, the neuro-ophthalmology team, this punctate focus. Restriction, uh, restricted diffusion, and it's just right there in the MLF. This makes sense. It can cause the INO, and by disrupting the um, utricular pathway uh, up to the midbrain, it's also causing a skew deviation. So I looked in this a little bit more. I'd always heard that uh, MRIs of the posterior fossa can sometimes miss a stroke, and so I, I wanted to look at this literature a little bit more because I never actually had a case where this happened. Um, and I found this uh, study done in uh, 2000. They had about 140 patients. They did MRs within 24 hours, and then they did it uh, uh, within 48 hours after that. They had a large number of people. They found, um, they found about 3% of the anterior circulation strokes uh, had negative DWIs in the first 24 hours. And then they found 31%, 10 times that, in the posterior circulation, posterior fossa, like our patient, had uh, negative DWIs in those first 20 hour, 24 hours. But this is really interesting is that um, uh, they should show up after 24 hours. According to the study, every single one did show up. So, lessons learned. Um, this is, this was, these were some great lessons for me to learn. One is that if one exam finding is kind of screwing up your whole diagnosis, then repeat it. Really make sure it is, be sure of it. And so we had him track our finger really quick. He didn't AD duct. Okay, no INO, moving on. And we should have said, no, 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 wait a minute, let's try that again, and had several people try it if, if needed. Um, two, um, and this is, this is something that, that came in, um, that, that was really handy uh, with a recent case I had on pediatric neurology where if you think you have two diagnoses that kind of coexist and they seem like they, uh, if it's like a lesion site, they're, they're separated by a, uh, by a great deal of space or they're just completely different parts of the body and you think that they're happening at the same time, well, one might be chronic, one might be acute, or you might be just wrong about one of them. 
And so I had a similar case um, where, th where I was able to apply this principle recently on pediatric neurology where we had, um, uh, had a six-year-old kid who had a seizure, uh, came in and we, uh, from an outside hospital, and, and when I examined him, he seemed to have this uh, downbeat nystagmus and ataxia in his right arm. And I thought, oh, great, so I think I can localize this. He's got something in his cerebellum, and it's affecting his uh, cervical medullary junction, and that's why he has that downbeat nystagmus. Then as I examined him further, I found he had a right hemifield defect. And so as I sat down and thought about it, I thought, okay, so I've got something here and I've got something here. What are the odds they both happened at the same time? Do you remember what happened with that last case? Think, think, which one doesn't make sense? Went back and re-examined him. This wasn't ataxia, this was weakness. So he had weakness here, right side of visual defect, that kind of pointed to here. So why has he got downbeat nystagmus? Think, think. Oh, that's right. What did they give him at the outside hospital? Phosphenicoin. And that explained his downbeat nystagmus, which resolved. The other symptoms did not, and the MRI confirmed um, his lesion. And then the final note is just Im imaging, even MRI, is not perfect, and it's good to know its limitations. And so I thought it would be neat to do a little literature research and see that uh, um, kind of the numbers there of 3% to 20% or to 30% in the first 24 hours. Thank you very much. Any questions? better off.